Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Talking Landscape Photography. It's awesome to uh, be back with you tonight and um, really excited about the guest we have tonight, Tabitha Badger. We, um, I've been following her work for a long time uh, and um, not just in the photography area, but also in um, her environmental advocacy and some of the incredible causes that she's um, working very hard on and, and getting quite a bit of traction on as well, which is super, super exciting. So, um, and of course, we're joined by um, Ben Mays and Paul, uh, Paul Holland as well. How are you going, guys? Good. Thanks, Luke. Good to be here tonight. Very much looking forward to this episode. Um, yeah, yeah, keen to hear all about it. And Paula, so how have you been? What have you been up to? Yeah, I've had the most amazing week, man. I've, I've been over in Melbourne judging the uh, Australian Photographic Prize. I got invited again to come over and judge it. I, and I did three, uh, well, two categories that were, were quite edgy for me, video and and I got to, invited to judge the um, inaugural uh, Australian Astrophotography Awards as well. And so uh, video is something I, I've been dabbling in for years and and but it's certainly not a master of. So uh, all the panels that they choose, they usually have people that are experts in their field and then they get people like myself that, that have a broad understanding of a lot of different genres and a fair bit of experience judging to come in and, and sort of round out the panel with sort of fresh eyes in a way. So but to be on the panel with, you know, professors of astrophysics or people that run observatories and and judging deep space photography it was like oh my god and me and peter iso were sitting there shaking our hands going what are we going to say but it ended up being a beautiful balance so i learned so much about the universe in, in just a few days and the caliber of the the, the photography was world class they had entries from 14 different countries and five continents on the very first competition of the kind of had and but at the same time, you know, you could see that, so they had the, the the scientific reasoning behind, you know, this cluster is here and this is a particularly different, difficult place to find or, or this, that particular kind of dust, dust path, that, you know, requires, you know, 17 different filters to come out and all these things that I wouldn't have a clue how to do. But but we had a very good uh, take on on where the, the emotion and the, and the narrative and the the pictorial elements and the compositional elements that it came into play in, in terms of what made it a great photograph. So it ended up being a, a beautiful amount of teamwork and um yeah I, was... I quite like that idea too having the offsetting the scientific aspect with the the aesthetic aspect and and yeah i'm i'm sure that that um made the um the results much more kind of uh, meaningful as well well i think it sort of made it a bit more uh uh what's the word um a bit broader and a bit more um comprehensive in terms of i mean it is a it's a photographic contest it's not an astronomy contest so so you, it, it's really important to have people that can reflect on it and um and speak to the pictorial and, and compositional and emotive kind of narrative communication elements of a photo as, as much as a technical because that's that would be very appropriate so it was pretty flattered that andrew camera reached out and, and asked me in particular to be involved with that and i've certainly put my hand up again for next year and uh yeah and i've had a lot of feedback i've been speaking to a lot of winners the last few days and that they really appreciated the whole conversation if people want to they can watch the whole competition uh live streamed uh, and it's been recorded online uh just look up australian photographic prize on the website and you'll find the links so the uh, live judging was just for the last 20 the, the top 25 images so there was a there was a top 25 images for the digital categories so i spent a whole week beforehand judging a lot of the digital categories offline and you know there's i don't know i don't know how many entries we had it would have been thousands uh and then there was only enough space over over a few days to judge a certain amount of images live and, and give them the credit and time they need to to be spoken to and and challenged and uh, given feedback from uh and then there was also the print categories which are different again so what was really interesting is I, I entered three categories, scenic, uh, which was basically the digital version of landscape, and then I entered nature and wildlife as well. Uh, and then I also entered landscape print. And it's one of the few competitions left in the world that, that judges print uh, live and in front of live panels, which I think is it's the most wonderful thing to be there live and, and looking right up close at some of the most beautiful work that you know, a lot of the greatest photographers in the country are producing right now. It's, it's a bloody privilege. And um, I gave it a fair shake of the old stick. I haven't entered much for anything for a while, but I, I put, I think, 12 images in and I got 10 in the finals, which means I was 90 or above. So in upper days, that, that would have been 10 golds. <laughs> so what, um, have they finished judging the, um, the whole print comp as well? 
Yeah, yeah, I was uh, I was there for it. So it's all done and dusted. Yeah. Uh, all the windows have been announced. I um, I think I got high score in print, the second highest print in scenic, and uh, and I got four in the finals there. I got two in the finals in Nature Wildlife and four, I think four out of my four, or no, four out of my five. I got finals in landscape print, which is probably the best I've ever done actually. But uh, and my good friend David Dahlenberg and I were were equal top in the scenic, so we we were like, oh, we were making jokes online about how it's going to go, and uh, and then I didn't win anything after all that. Oh no! <laughs> so it's my best chance ever of winning a category. But for people who are wondering how it works, you, you have a scoring base out of hundred, and that determines the finalists. So if you in this particular contest, if you got ninety or above. Uh, which is pretty amazing thing to do. You're automatically a finalist, and then if they didn't have five images that were above ninety, they would go backwards and choose the top five in score range. And then what's very different is they then take all of those images aside and they wipe all the scores off, and it's a fresh start with a different panel of judges in a private room. And even I have no idea what happens there or what conversations come up or how they determine the winner. And in a lot of cases, it's not actually the image that was chosen with the highest score at that particular time. I think they have a lot more time to slow down and use sort of comparative judgments across the different elements of the photographs. And they also have the proviso of choosing, you know, the greatest image that represents that genre in the current time as well. And so this is kind of like a semi-political context to how they choose the winners, but it's it's kind of amazing and mysterious and kind of frustrating that you have no idea what, what actually happens in the back room and why that image won and they're sworn to secrecy, uh, never to be told. So I got bridesmaid to Tony Hewitt again and the landscape print, which was my great dream to win. Um, but if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, be a bridesmaid to someone, it's it's somebody you look up to to the level of him. Uh, so congratulations uh, again, Mr. Hewitt. Uh, and Iggy, Iggy won two categories. I got lots of, this is Ignacio Palacios. I got lots of messages of him during the judging. Uh, probably about 17. <laughs> have, I, have I won yet was most of the most of the messages. And I thought about being rude to him, but then he ended up winning both categories at the end. And I was like, you little bugger. <laughs> so, uh, so he's pretty proud of himself. He hasn't done anything for a while. But um, to sum it up, just incredible to be around community and to be around a celebration of my craft, like in real life and in real time and not through a screen. And and we had trade shows and speakers and workshops and uh, as well as beautiful social events. And I, I'd say it's a premier event in Australia. And certainly if you weren't there, that resource of going and watching that judging is there's nothing like it in the country to get that level of live feedback from a lot of the greatest photographers in the country, particularly genre specific with their experience. Um, if you want to learn a lot of things about imagery and visual communication and visual and up your visual literacy and get to see how other people see, I, I highly recommend taking some time to, to look through those. There's 12 different categories and, and plenty to go through. Um, yeah, I was, um, I was watching a little bit of the print judging online. I had a stake of four prints in the final sort of, uh print judging for landscape so it was cool to sort of anxiously watch back on that and see how they went um so yeah no it was really really cool um luke i believe you had a bit of uh comp in uh news as well with the david mallon awards you were up yes, my yes. Way I, I don't know if it was very sadistic timing or what but the um the australian um photography prize or whatever the um judging for the uh astrophotography category was exactly on the same day as when they had the announcement of the David Malin Award. So I don't know if that's, um, ironically, I think one of the winners of, of the um, portrait, the photography prize um, was on his way to the Malin Awards and couldn't be there for the photographic prize one. So hopefully they don't have a, a clash like that again, because I, I do think it's it's kind of nice, but it's also a little bit um, disrespectful for the Malin Awards um but uh, that's been um running for 19 years so they're um having their big 20th next year but yeah it was really nice to be able to um head out to uh parks so i just got back um very recently and um was um went there with my good friend ben aldridge who uh, actually won the mobile smartphone category taking um astro photographs with um with a phone is, is no mean feat and he managed to take out um 
essentially first, second, and third with that. And um, I was um, lucky to be a runner-up in the um, nightscapes category. So as part of that, I actually am uh, able to have um, my image um, exhibited in uh, parks in the uh, observatory there, which is pretty exciting. Um, should have a couple of photos here. Um, I won't be able to... Well, that's time, but um, yeah, it was it was quite um, an awesome experience to be there and some really great talks and, and guests and I got to meet some great people as well. So if you're ever heading out to parks and, and to the um, the dish, which is, um, you know, one of the, the iconic um, uh, sort of landmarks of the area, then there's a, um, a gallery exhibition in the um, room there at, in the visitor centre and I'll have a shot in there and, and Ben has a couple as well. And um, yeah, really great one. And it actually tours around the country. They, they actually said that um, based on the stats, it's actually the largest touring exhibition um, in the country, given where it actually um, goes in terms of how many people visit it. So that's kind of cool awesome. to, to be involved wow. and, and yeah. to see what they actually uh, come up with next year in terms of um, the, the 20th anniversary. But yeah, it's um, definitely um, a great one to be part of. Um, and also... Um, been uh, been uh, shortlisted in the Australian Geographic Nature Photographer as well in the monochrome category. So um, that's also been quite exciting. And um, that that uh, announcement's only about a month away in terms of um, having the everything revealed there. So that's all. All um yeah, it's been a bit of a one of those years um, where my um, I guess uh, awards have haven't gone so badly, which um you know have your purple patches every now and then, and it seems to be um the year for it. So um mm. yeah, definitely worth. Uh, Paul and I are also doing some critique sessions, so keep an eye out on that, and that really helps you get prepared for your awards and and um so you can uh, get the best result you can. So um that's, that's yeah uh, yeah. Luke and I've been talking about that for a while, and we just figured it's it's kind of silly. We're in a pretty pretty wonderful position to offer a lot of experience and insight into. Well, preparing images for a publication or um, for an awards sort of structure or for an exhibition or just really to, to dig into the underlying elements of your image that can be refined further in terms of their communication, their composition, the pictorial elements, the emotional impact, their storytelling. And um, yeah, I'll certainly get pretty excited about that sort of thing. So the idea that we had is that you prepare sort of three to five images and that you like feedback on and they might be your best of the best or there might be ones you're actually struggling with that you really would like um, some, an extra uh, hand in terms of understanding how to move forward in that particular genre or style of photography. And yeah, like down the track, I think it'd be something we'd like to offer a bit more regularly and to do with groups. And And I often do, I do a lot of that one-on-one -on -one photographers around the world I've been doing for a long time and I, I just haven't really made it really formal and advertise it. So I thought I should might get off my butt and make it a bit more available. And just in terms of awards, our probably show's favourite is coming up, the NLPA Awards. Yes. The Natural Landscape Photography Awards are coming up, I think, in another – is it another one week? week? One week. One week to close. I've uh, been trying to finalise my project entries and individual entries and all of that frantically <laughs> over the last week as I've left that to the last minute. I'm, uh, I'm yeah, that's, that's such boat, one, I think, in my opinion, I think it's the best – nature photography competition in the world i think it's they it's only very new it's only it's running in its third year this year um but the founders matt payne and tim parkin and alex nail and rajesh i think his name is or can't remember his name properly but absolutely fantastic awards it's really ethical about the post processing and that is allowed um there's raw verification there's amazing prizes available um and reasonably priced and it really really aims to make it a very level playing ground. It does, it also, it puts a cap on how many photos you can enter. So it doesn't become a competition of who has the most, you know, budget to splurge on as many entries as they want. It's, um, it's a really, really great uh, competition. I highly recommend anyone who yeah, enjoys that sort of natural, uh, bit more sort of capturing the reality of nature style of photography. Um, definitely check that one out. I was um, preparing my recent wave gallery. Uh, for, I've got a selection of these sort of, uh, wave photos from my recent release that I'm entering as a project. I'm very keen to see how that goes, um, as well as a selection of sort of individual entries as well. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be my my big things lately is working on projects. This this gallery release being a major thing for the last couple of months for me that I've been working on. 
Um, and then, yeah, preparing for some comp entries as well, just frantically <laughs> before the deadlines uh, come around the bend. So, yeah, no, it's good. Award season is upon us well and truly. Your, your preparation real, your preparations are about 10 times earlier than mine, mate. I'm, 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 I'm like a thing. But uh, they, they have a very low entry point in terms of cost, so it's probably one of the more accessible contests in the world as well. Uh, yeah. Financial oh, it's, it's and a good tip with it is to they do have a, I think they have discounted entries initially, so you can actually sign up, which is what I which I've done. You sign you can sign up to um, put entries in without actually having to choose which images you want to put in, and and you can get it at a bit of a cheaper rate. So oh, I didn't um, do that. Yeah, and so next time when they open it up, um, it doesn't feel right to to get entries so soon, with especially if you don't have the images ready. But it's a, it's a great way of saving a bit of money and also uh, making sure that you do actually enter. So I'd, now that I've paid for it, I better make sure I actually remember to put the shots in there. So. <laughs> That'd yeah, the guys, cool. um, they also put out a fantastic book every year, um, which yeah. I was fortunate enough to be in year two. I think we all were. We? Oh, actually, we are, yeah, we were, weren't yeah. we? Yeah, I think actually, we all I were. Remember, I, I think I saw, I saw yours in book one, Paul, when I was staying at your place last year. Um, yeah. yeah, and I remember seeing yours from um, uh, down the Sapphire Coast, wasn't it, in yeah. there? Yeah. Um, Luke, um, yeah. not a few pages from mine. So, yeah, no, it's a, it's a fantastic product that they put out and they did. They put lots of effort into making sure it's a really great competition for everyone. Yeah, yeah it's yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing I didn't mention too um, is if I, I do have a whole bunch of um, online uh, sessions coming up too. So if you check the um, emails that are sent out um, about the show um, on, on our mailing list, um, you'll see some information or you can go to the Sony Scene website and that, that has a whole bunch of um, online workshops and things that I'm running and uh, coming up uh, pretty soon. So especially one on editing night photographs and uh, infrared I uh, just did one last night on bushwalking wilderness photography, which was a lot of fun. Um, and so, yeah, if you, you're keen on any of that, just um, either just get in touch with me or um, um, check the uh, details in the email as well. And I guess um, Paul and um, Ben are still, um, you know, uh, have positions for the Tarkine workshop as well. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Very so, keen so, on that. Still got yeah. positions available. So, yeah, you want an awesome five days exploring the Tarkine, one, just one of the best places in Tasmania, let alone Australia. Uh, for rainforest and coastline photography um yeah come join us it'll be a great time oh yeah absolutely um, yeah you can't, you can't beat that place not for the combination of the variety of the scope that it has and the drama like it's such a diverse incredible landscape and yeah we're going through 20 years it might be there's some crossover with tabitha in, in terms of what we talk about tonight in terms of the significance of that area uh from a national and global perspective as well so it'd, it'd be nice to see I, I might even put her on the spot to see see what she says about it. <laughs> but anyway, probably enough about us. We should probably start talking about yeah, it. Again. <laughs> absolutely. Um, well, yeah, no, thanks again uh, to Tabitha for joining us. And, um, yeah, thanks for also putting up with all of our um, our self, um, self-promotion there. But, um, yeah, Tabitha, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, um, great self-promotion. Talk about imposter syndrome. I don't think I've entered a competition since, um, like maybe a show back in the day sort of thing. But, um, yeah, absolutely. Like the Tarquin Coast, as you say, Paul, like what an amazing spot. I know I personally try and get up there at least once a year just to um, enjoy it and immerse myself in it, be it on the coastline itself or a little bit further back in the hills. It's absolutely extraordinary. Um yeah, so um, I um, I've been a, a big admirer of Tabitha's work, both with um her um photography work, but also her um environmental ag advocacy work. Um, uh, maybe um Tabitha, you could give us a bit of a, a background about yourself and and how you got into photography and and bushwalking and and also um, you know um how that may have um inspired you to do other things. Yeah, so I mean, it all kind of goes hand in hand, doesn't it? So at the moment, um, I'm working, as you say, at the start on the Restore Lake Pedder campaign, um, and I'm also the convener of the Tasmanian Wilderness Society. And, you know, as we all do, we help out wherever we can with any other um, campaign or organisations that are working to protect the places that we love. And photography is such a, an important tool for all of that. So obviously to get the photographs of those incredible places uh, a lot of it does involve you know, going quite remote so going out bushwalking and I'm not quite sure if photography justifies me climbing mountains and doing that sort of thing as often as I can or if it works vice versa but I mean the most beautiful places are often quite 
inaccessible. So uh, you do have to be prepared to go out there and, um, yeah, get amongst it. So for me, photography's, I guess, been the one consistent throughout my entire life. Um, my grandparents are heavily involved in photography, mostly locally through their camera club in Wynyard, actually. But every weekend they would, you know, take us out as kids to the local reserves and we had little disposable cameras that we could take along with us and who knows how much money our parents spent developing all the film that we used to take. But um, that really evolved um, growing up and getting more immersed in environmental places and seeing what was at stake. And you kind of become more aware of what's being lost over time when you revisit different reserves, um, particularly in the Northwest, that have, for example, been logged or on the verge of a logging coop and it incrementally loses some of its values. So from then you kind of see the value of a, a photograph of that place in its original state and not only for reflecting on it but for protecting what's left as well. So from that, um, I guess, evolved a bit of a personal awakening through, um, yeah, conservation and photography. Awesome, awesome. And so um, do you um, have a particular area that, that's like your favourite place to head off to um, when you're trying to get away or is it more about having a big list and, and trying to see see all of these different places that you hear or see about? Yeah, I've definitely got a big list. <laughs> but, I mean, anywhere really in Tasmania is really special. I think it was watercolour artist Max Angus spoke about the colours that, that we get here in Tasmania and he described it, you know, as the the blues that would reflect from Antarctica versus the the reds from the Northern Territory that would come down. And I think for me, exploring that is unlike the mountains anywhere else in the world. So I guess mountains seem to be the place that I'm drawn to and I haven't yet figured out exactly why that is. I guess because maybe you can be on top of it and look down and see a beautiful landscape, but also looking up at it in itself. It is its own being to kind of capture. And wherever I go is normally in the, the golden hour. So I'm first thing in the morning, late at night, and really capturing the just that moment when the light is at its brightest and just illuminating one particular aspect of the landscape in a specific way. So, And do you tend to yeah. uh, sort of uh, go whenever you have a chance or you have, you have you're sort of getting busier. So you need to kind of have everything sort of planned out pretty well in terms of when you have your time. And, and then when you do go, do you, uh, is it mainly solo trips? Yeah, I, I basically go whenever I can get time off. Yeah. <laughs> and that often depends where I go, depending how much time you could squeeze in, how quickly you think you can walk somewhere and, and get back um, in a weather window or a work window. And up until very recently, a lot of my trips were solo because of that spare of the moment um, necessity to go out to different places. It was really hard to coordinate with friends and other walkers to come along. So that, I guess has kind of shaped a bit of my landscape photography in that it is devoid of any other human figures, which I guess, you know, you could describe as a, a more of a purist landscape style. But, um, yeah, that that's just really shaped what I have. But then uh, more recently when I have been able to go on different works, um, you know, trips for work or specific campaign pauses, they've been a bit more organised with other people. And that's been, um, I guess, a really big learning experience for me as well, to be able to share that those beautiful moments and teach other people aspects of, you know, what you're looking at in a landscape and different composition and light, and then also learn from them what they appreciate as a part of it too. So, yeah, really actually enjoyed <laughs> making that part of it. Yeah, it's, it's such a different... Yeah, it's such um, experience when you um yeah you you hike with yourself or with others and uh, i think um my experience i i can't say i prefer more, one more than the other but um you certainly learn so much from other people when you go out there but you, they do tend to be a bit of a distraction and and um your experience is quite different and maybe not quite as um rich and um immersive uh, as it may have been and um i saw mm -hmm. one of your recent trips was out to the spiro area um, could you um, talk a little bit more about that area and um, and you know some of the you know the the, the folks that came along and, and and what have you? 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's, yeah, that's the other thing about having people with you. They're not always keen to get up at 3 a.m. to go and start walking. <laughs> um, the spirit trip was um, definitely the biggest group of people I've been out with in a while. Um, extraordinary cohort to go out with. Uh, so it was organised through the Wilderness Society and we had um, the great people at the Bob Brown Foundation kindly lent us some pack rafts. So, um, yeah, we went from Hibbs Pyramid and I can get a photo up while I'm talking as well. Oh, awesome. Um But, yeah, so we had a, yeah extraordinary group of people that went out there, um, you know, including Jeff Law who helped um, obviously have the area enlisted as part of the World Heritage, um, sorry, the surrounding area, part of the World Heritage area, and has been working on the Southwest Conservation Area where the Spiro and Wanderer Rivers are uh, to be included in part of that at the moment because it is under protected as part of the Southwest Conservation Area. So, so we that's really focused area that's on sort this. of in the bottom. Um, if you're looking at a map of Tassie, it's the sort of bottom left-hand corner, isn't it? Yeah, it's like the one section out of the bottom quarter. Um, if you look at it really closely, it kind of looks like a bit of a hand, like you put the thumb and the finger and it's, you know, rumoured to be called Christine Milne's hand because when they were <laughs> negotiating the boundaries of the Twa, um, yeah, they got into a bit of a dispute about where the areas would land and she put a hand down on the map and said, no, you're not having any more for industrial exploits. And so they just drew around a hand and said, oh, well, we're just going to have that bit. So, <laughs> So for people, That's, uh, that, people that don't know Twa's the Tasmanian World Heritage Area, is that right? Tasmanian Wilderness, yeah, World Heritage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the Southwest Conservation Area. Um, yeah. So and- it was a little bit different heading out to that area because I'm so used to photographing mountains and there really wasn't any there. The closest thing that was um, a feature, and I'm, I'm hoping you can all see... Uh, pyramid yes yes absolutely yeah the hips pyramid um is i i guess the most iconic sort of feature in the area that you can recognize so it's just north of high rocky point it's about um an hour's very rough boat trip from Strawn, and we yeah we landed there there were um probably half a dozen of us in this group um, made up of, you know, different people that were conservationists and also have worked in the area on different programs. So um, John Marsden Smedley, who runs the Sprats program out there, which is the sea spurge eradication, and they drop people in along the shoreline up there as well. So we had some great knowledge from people that had already walked in the area. So where we were was a um, trackless area there had been tracks in the past but they were largely overgrown so we're just trying to find old markers um some people might be familiar the hobart walking club used to literally use little shades of blinds to mark different tracks on the sides of trees so that was um part of what we were following down there so did um, you um, mention you you went in uh from via strawn or that's just one way you could get there but you you went in via pack raft uh, we went in via boat to, oh, yeah. yeah, this um, just opposite Hibs Pyramid is called Sanctuary Cove. So we got dropped yeah. off there. Ah. Um, via Strawn is the other way. There's the um, low rocky point track that a lot of people go in from there. And yeah. then you can drop in um, at the headwaters of the, the Spiro or the Wanderer River and then pack raft down from there. Okay. But we focused on the coastline for its huge diversity of geology right along the coast Mm. and so we walked um over Hibbs point and then over to white horses beach so spending a lot a lot of time on the coast we got to experience the absolute most wild weather but also as you saw before how sublime and calm it really could be as well So the whole area for its um, like geodiversity really is a bit like the Tarkine Coast, but completely on steroids. You can walk for a day and see what you would see in a week on the Tarkine Coast down here. It's really quite extraordinary. That's and of course, um, yeah, 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 it's absolutely extraordinary. But um, of course, like all of the rivers really, in Tassie, um, 
the hue and pines were kind of the go-to for the extractive industries. So the Spiro River um, in particular was, I guess, the closest to Strawn, so the easiest for some of the boats to get to. So that um, extraction of the hue and pines was really what drew people down there in the late 1800s through to the 1930s and 40s. But, I mean, this is the area in the photograph here in the river where a lot of the uh, pining happened. But as you can see, it's, it's still a really beautiful environment and so much of the vegetation as it does in that area has grown back really quickly. You're uh, also obviously going to miss that, that you river. Is where you're screen sharing, we're just still seeing the, um, the boat in the river oh. on the coast. Okay. Sometimes if you share it to a specific window, it gets stuck on that window if you change what you... Yeah, oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. We got... Yeah, we've oh, got the river thank now. Thank you, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you also know it's super shallow, so our pack rafts were redundant pretty quickly. Oh, well. <laughs> they were That's, handy to get up, yeah, the first maybe kilometre or so, but that was all really. Um, unfortunately... Oh, so beautiful. And the um, all the shingle banks that are through here, um, this image doesn't depict it as well as it should, but they're just pure white, beautiful, really contrast off the green and the trees and the, the dark of the river as well. It's absolutely beautiful. On the trip, we did have um, the worst really um, kind of photographic <laughs> conditions. It was pouring basically every morning so we were very reluctant to get our cameras out and then over the afternoon it would, it would come out completely sunny so all of our gear would dry off but then everything was just way too bright to be able to accurately get a picture of the river so it was a, it was a little bit disappointing um for us but I'm sure you would have seen Grant Dixon's photographs from a trip he went up a little bit earlier and did a bit of a reconnaissance before our trip yeah. And yeah, he's got some fantastic ones, particularly of that white shingle bank as well. Mm. Yeah. And so this is, um, I mean, this would have to be one of the most remote uh, parts of, um, well, certainly Tasmania, if not, um, you know, the country as well, in terms of access and, and being able to get there. So what you're talking about is a place that, that um, you know, it's not, not too many um, folks would have got to over the, over the years. Yeah, that's right. And so with all the extractive history with the hue and pining, that, that was the greatest issue was access. So a lot of the tracks would overgrow with good old bower or cutting grass really quickly and then who wants to have to keep pre-cutting that or walking through it? And because of the weather on the coast, they just couldn't get boats in or out so that that industry failed very quickly. And, but it's also kind of a reflection of what the future could be in terms of tourism, so obviously when we talk about protecting an area, some people get a bit hesitant that it might become overloved or overvisited. But by the sheer nature of the isolation and the wild weather of the southwest conservation area, it's not somewhere that that's going to be practically possible. So like you say, the people go down, you know, for various reasons over the years have cut tracks to different lighthouses along the coastline or to reach shipwrecks or so that people who got shipwrecked could get out um, and back to Macquarie Harbour and Strawn. But they all become overgrown so quickly. The vegetation is, is really quite extraordinary in some of the um, kind of more densely forest areas. We found a, just a dogwood that was lying on the ground and basically the, the main trunk of this tree was 20 to 30 metres long and then it had different shoots coming up from it and that was in basically the entire of the this forest that we were walking through it was really quite extraordinary so um yeah absolutely magnificent place and it's it's pretty cool to be in a part of the world where there are more healthy tasmanian devils running around your campsite of a night than there are possums <laughs> wow and so i guess that speaks to why um you know it's obviously worthy of inclusion in the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area, but um, it's just more like an administrative thing that that it hasn't been added in there. Is there um other reasons why a place like that wouldn't wouldn't be included? Yes, so there are a few minor mining leases in the area, and that's basically a legacy issue. There's yeah. never been any kind of extractive 
rare minerals on an industrial scale to make anything economically viable. And again, the weather and the isolation make it hard for any kind of big scale project to do that. So a lot of those mining leases come up for renewal uh, between 2025, 2030 time. So it's really good to begin the conversation about the Spiro Wander area now and see that we can't have that area included because that boundary extension is pretty straightforward to be able to do. And it yeah, can basically just become part of the you know, Franklin Gordon National Park and the Tasmanian Wilderness World Heritage Area as well. Mm. Yeah, there's um, more than enough areas that should be added, but uh, yeah, it does sound like that one's a, a pretty straightforward um, decision. Um, you know, should that should that um, you know get get to that get to that point and I guess that's the the reason why folks are going in there to get the the pictures and and help people understand exactly um you know what's out there because um it's hard for people to form that connection with the place do you feel that that's um you know still a primary way of of um um getting kind of uh, you know participation with with new people and and um taking them on the journey is there other ways too yeah I think photographs, I mean, they're the, the main state conservation campaigns for, for very good reason. They they speak for a place that otherwise can't speak for itself and that not everybody can get to. Or perhaps in the case of the Spiro and Wanda Wilderness region, even no exists. So I think photography, um, videography is really important as well. And I think um you know, aerial imagery now from drones is really important as well to capture the, the vast spaces in some of these areas. I mean, traditionally in conservation campaigns and early on in landscape photography, you know, we saw the vast sweeping black and white photographs from um, Stephen Sperling, H.J. King, Gustav Weindorfer even, and they'd use that um, to completely capture the landscape from atop a mountain and then use that um, to take it back to bureaucrats and say, you know, you can see all these key um, landmarks and features and this area is really important and list the reasons. Whereas a, a lot of that mountainous area is protected and when we're talking about forests, um, it's really hard to capture the, the vast scale of it. So we've got the technology now where we can capture it. We've also got colour photography, which makes a huge difference um, for people to have that emotional attachment to it and really bring out the the beauty of the area so I think yeah it's a great way to not only um have an emotional connection to a place or begin forming an emotional connection to a place that you haven't been to through photography but also just to start a conversation it's really important and I guess um something like like Peta the the photographs uh, you know that's all that remains um and and hopefully you know can show what it what it can be restored back to and I guess um in that in that in that case as well um uh, there's there's quite a lot um, that photographs can do. Tabitha, do you want to speak yeah. to to about Lake Peta? Like there are people that want to know what it is or the significance of it and where it's at, mm. there and what the campaign's about. Do you want to give it a little bit of backstory because it's, it's yeah. A good one. And a sad one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty complex. And so if you look at a map today, you'll see Lake Pedder is a massive impoundment. But, I mean, the original Lake Pedder was a 10-square-kilometre lake um, nestled under the Franklin Range, and it had a, a kilometre-wide pink quartzite beach, and it was the only you know, alpine quartzite beach in the world. But... Adjacent to that, there was also the Serpentine Valley, which had a, a river running up at the snaked its way up the valley, hence the Serpentine. And that whole area has really important endemic peat soils in it. So when we're looking at the current climate of the world, um, that endemic Tasmanian peat soil hasn't been part of the global carbon bank. And that whole wetland system um, is a really important ecosystem. So the area was flooded in 1972 to create a hydro storage lake for the Gordon Power Scheme. And when we're looking at restoring it now, obviously Lake Petter itself is a, a beautiful second to none landscape area that, you know, had the same spiritual significance as Uluru or the Great Barrier Reef. But we're also looking at a, a climate and biodiversity standpoint. So you've got the whole 
Serpentine Valley and a, a lot of species that are really important to the southwest that were only found in that area that can quite easily be restored back to it if you try water leveling impoundment and restore that area. So there's a another really important feature in the area that you can still see today called the Edgar Fault Line. It is a quite obvious fault line if you're standing at Red Knoll or Mount Anne, um, anywhere up on the Eliza Plateau um, and a little bit from the Franklin Range as well. But two of the dams are actually built on the fault line. And I'm not an engineer, but that doesn't seem very smart. So um, those dams have to be brought up to contemporary safety level, which is going to cost the Tasmanian government at least $100 million and climbing. Um, so now's a really good opportunity for the Tasmanian government to not invest that money in upgrading the, the safety of these dams, but to invest in the restoration of Lake Pedder and create jobs through restoration. So Pedder as a storage impoundment contributes, uh, on average for the last decade, it's about 57 megawatts annually to the Tasmanian grid, which is like a 40 small size turbine wind farm. Or by comparison, the Franklin the Franklin Dam would have been 180 megawatts. So it's a third of what that would have been. So it's not a matter of energy security um, in that sense. So it is, it's really exciting. And the original images, as you say, Luke, are the only thing really that, that remain. Um, and the stories of the people that, that visited Lake Pitter as well are really, really important to be told and shared. And I mean, yeah, I also, like everyone. There's also Sorry. been um, uh, divers gone down, I think, and also uh, established that the, mm. the beach is actually still intact. So if it was was drained, then in you know that that would be a feature that's still going to be present. Yeah, there's um, luckily there's only a few millimeters of sediment that have built up on the beach, which is really rare in a lot of large impoundments in the US particularly after wildfires, and we know this area of the southwest is quite susceptible to, to bushfires in recent years, they do have quite a large build-up of sediment and it makes the water really toxic, and that hasn't happened here. So we're very lucky. Um, geomorphologist Kevin Keenan estimates it would be, say, maximum of two seasons of normal average rainfall events, and that sediment would be washed away and the beach would be its you know, that, the pink, white, quartzite, wow. shimmering self again. Wow. And I guess um, you could say that, um, you know, that the the, um, the uh, potential for tourism or, or um, you know, uh, just even uh, the statement that would make for uh, Tasmania itself to, to sort of be focused on restoration and, and the environment like that would be quite a, quite a dramatic statement to make and, and I'm sure would be acknowledged around the world if, if a decision like that was made. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's in Australia's State of the Environment report from 2021. It says, you know, Lake Petter would be the symbol of hope to the world in a climate and biodiversity disaster that we can both admit and repair past environmental mistakes. It would just be the biggest not only symbol, but the start of shifting society's values. And I guess when we have so many different environmental causes fighting for our attention, if it's you know, the forest or the health of our waterways, a lot of people do ask, you know, why bother with restoring Lake Pedder? Is it urgent? It's still there. We could do it in 20 or 50 years. But it is urgent because we have to change something in conservation. We have to do something different. And I think to restore something, particularly of the value of Lake Pedda, will fundamentally shift um, how we see the natural world and how we approach uh, different conservation aspects. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's, uh, amazing yeah. to think that, that that's um, something that's actually possible. So, um, yeah, it's um, pretty pretty awesome. And, and your role at, with um, uh, the Wilderness Society, what other uh, things does that get you doing and, and um uh, you know, uh, other projects and things. Yeah, so there, are, there is a bit on. Um, <laughs> obviously, one of the, the major things at the moment is the Lake Malbina campaign. So the private tourism development that's proposed on the island, um, it's currently under EPBC 
assessment for further information. So Tanya Pluvisek has to make a decision on that. Um, it's been delayed until August the 16th. So it'll be really interesting to see whether she approves the project or not, particularly around, um, you know, a inc huge increase of heli tourism into the World Heritage Area, the effect that that not only has on people who recreate in the Twa, but also on a lot of the endangered species, so particularly the Tasmanian wedge-tailed eagle, that um, we really need some more updated surveys to see um, how prevalent they are within the area as to what the impact really would be. So there's an awful lot happening in that space and a lot of people sitting tight to see what happens there because if the Lake Malbina proposal goes ahead, kind of opens the door to a lot of other different proposals um, within the World Heritage Area, be that um, along the South Coast track um, is probably going to be the next Thing that comes up so um parts i guess similar to what we see along the overland track at the moment but obviously that means that there'll need to be a lot of upgrades to the south coast track as well so that it can actually cater for, for a lot more people going through there so that's also a huge area of focus being the south coast track um yeah and just going down and, and spending a lot of time on country i'm sure um you've all been down there and the, the really sense of connection that you get walking along that South Coast track is kind of unlike anywhere else. You kind of feel like there is definitely another presence in the area. And that's that's something that is really, really hard to capture and bring back to anyone that hasn't been there. That's something that definitely transcends the ability of photography, unfortunately. Mm, well, I mean, I, I have to admit, I haven't done um, much of the South Coast track. Um, I've, I've done the um, Lion Rock end and I've also been into Malaluka and, and spent some time there. But I'm um, yeah, definitely very keen to to have that experience. And it does look like a, a very immersive sort of thing to do. And I guess the um, whilst it might sound um, nice for, for um, people that haven't been as established as bushwalkers to have huts along the way it obviously dramatically mm. changes what the wilderness values of the area actually are and and and, and it changes it forever uh, so that's why there's, there's such a uh, conversation around that um so have you guys um done the south coast pool ben well look you and i both have very fond memories at uh, lion rock yeah uh, from our absolutely. Facebook couple of nights um back in 2019 yeah. Um, for those who don't know, yeah, we had managed to catch the Aurora and bioluminescence and setting Milky Way core and zodiacal light all in one frame mm. um, back in 2019. And then the following morning, got one of the best sunrises we saw all year. So, yeah, yeah it was um, pretty special. It was, uh, that was on our second night. We got skunked the first day. So, I balanced out at least. But yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's an incredible spot down there. And even just that little, what, two hour or so hike in. Um, it feels like a really special place and you just you feel like you're on the edge of the world down there where you're one of the most lowest like spots in the Australian continent that you can be um, and so yeah there's some I, I'd, I'd love to do some more there's so much more of Tassie that I'm really keen to hike through being up in Sydney makes that hard to do regularly but yeah the, the south coast tracks very much up there amongst some of the the mountainous stuff as well um, mm. yeah Paul have you done much yeah, it's one of the first things I ever did 24, 25 years ago was yeah. the uh, South Coast track. And that was probably my deepest, most intimate introduction to what, you know, the, the real deal mm. that the wilderness is about. And uh, it was still a fairly established track in those days and even more so now. But I actually did a side trip down most of the way to Southwest Cape as well. Uh, which at the time was was giving things a bit of a nudge for, for uh, in, a, in a lot of ways. That's a little bit less less of a trotted path and and i i think I, I remember having a 33 kilo pack when i took off on that trip and i wanted to give myself at least a two-week window with myself and my partner just to just to see and this you know the indigenous history of places like louisa bay the the classic kind of traversing the iron bounds the the, the, the running down the huge granite rock beaches the, the waterfalls that are just pouring over the edge of these escarpments or right onto the beach like over your head like it uh, it's hard to put it into words, you know, and even starting at Melaleuca and the, and the flight in and um, walking down and, and to the to first sort of opening bays down there. And as a surfer, there's actually a whole bunch of, uh, of hidden surf spots tucked down the coast. And a lot of the big wave surfers will are friends with trawlers and fishermen and they'll, they'll head down there on trips or they'll, or they'll get dropped off at Melaleuca and walk down to the coast at 
is it Echo Port? I'm trying to remember. Uh, and they'll, they'll spend time down there. And I think some of the best ways I've ever seen it is actually, I don't know if you guys, you probably have walked as far down to the next bay over from Lion Rock. Uh, we've got across the river. Uh, is that like at um, uh, Prime, Prime Beach or um, Granite? Is it Granite oh, it's well, it's well before then. It's, yeah. it's the next beach over from Lion Rock. That, I, was, I, was, I remember sitting there once with my mouth open for two and a half hours just going, I've never seen so many spinning barrels in my, in my life. <laughs> and, and then there's the wonderful classic uh, rowboat crossing down in front of the um, precipitous bluff. Like that's that's just quite a unique sort of experience. Like there's not many places you get to do that in Tassie. And you right. have to do three rows to sort of, you know, get over there and bring a boat back and then bring the other way back again. And, you know, it's, it's not a given that you're going to get across some of these uh, rivers at times. And, we had a few days out at Louisa Bay, which was a very deeply spiritual time. You could just almost feel and see the old people just out of the corner of your eye down there with just how rich an area that was to to live. It, it's yeah, it's a profound walk. I, I highly recommend it, Jen. So I am um, not as big a fan of, of from the from the walk from Scotts Peak through that area, but I'd certainly happily do the South Coast again any day. Mm. Yeah, like there was um there was a yeah. few surfers that um came through well in our little stay down there i remember like i think it was that first day or like after our first night there was maybe eight to ten surfers at one point just yeah getting these beautiful cresting waves onto the beach and just one of the most scenic <laughs> places it was Paul being pretty was, jealous that's, that, yeah, yeah I, sure. I, there was, I remember trying to track you guys down and and coming to join you on the trip and, and you did a last minute change of of venue and I and I missed it. Mm. And not only did I miss the, the conditions, I knew the surf was pumping down there. I was just yeah. like, and I, I actually usually goes down there for both. My, my classic is to go down for four days solo and um, and sh- and I, I wait till there's a good surf event. So I at least get at least a good day surfing and then I'll spend the rest of the time shooting and wandering. It's, it's, um, mm. it's a really quite an accessible place really for, for uh, such a wild wild area like you just drive down as far as you can on the southernmost road in tasmania and then you walk on really quite a beautiful easy track for an hour and a half two hours and then wow and the campsites are really beautiful and they can handle most sort of weather water's water's pretty consistent year round uh the surf's right there i remember one time getting a bit of a fright and it ended up being one of the best experiences i've ever had I, you're a little bit more sort of watching it back when you're on your own, you know, like, and I was out there surfing alone and, you know, it's, it's a big wild coastline. He's sort of, and all of a sudden I saw, I saw a couple of, um, uh, fins coming at me and I was like, Oh crap. And I'm way out the back and I was and oh. like, going to get straight at me. And I was like, Oh my God, I started turning around. And then I thought, wait a minute, if it's more than one fin, what does that mean? I've never really seen sharks as a group. Dolphins. Um, but it turned out to be a pot of dolphins and they just oh, wow. flew out of the water right next to me and I started taking off on this wave and they were right next to me, just almost looking me in the eye, jumping out of the wave while I was riding it. It was just, yeah, I don't wow. know how to That's put awesome. that into words. That, that, a video that, of, a, of a dolphin jumping out of a wave and whacking a guy off his board <laughs> up in Sydney recently. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 saw, I saw that one, but that's, <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah, that's a very special experience. And it's, yeah. and it's, uh, wow. that was on YouTube or with 10 people looking. I was just down there on my own in a super wild place and I didn't even see anyone else for another couple of days. It was, no, it's, it's, it was, it's it was all about magic. getting out there. Um, and so, um, no, it's oh, just bio and I asked her at the same time. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not, not bad. Must be the place where, it's kind of the place where all the magic happens on the South Coast track. I really find it. I went down there for Christmas not that long ago and the weather was absolutely terrible. The flight got delayed numerous times across three different days and finally got down there. So there was kind of a really brief weather window and there was maybe 12 people that got in in that weather window and that was it. And it just happened that in those people that, that got through in this most wild weather, it was the worst plane ride you could ever, ever wish for. We didn't see any of the scenery. Um, one of the other people actually that was there, um, I heard of this other solo female hiker walking along the track. So I thought when we got to the, the boat crossing <laughs> there at the end of Prion that you were talking about, Paul, it would be really handy to have someone else to help go across on. And the the person, it turned out to be Rima Trahanis, um, Alegis's daughter. Mm. And so I spoken to her via email about better things, but I'd never actually met her. I thought of all the places in the world that you could end up meeting someone like that it was there so i had i had a companion for the rest of the trip after that it was fantastic 
Wow. That's quite a story. So to, re- to round that story out, Olegas Churhanis um, was the greatest sort of conservation mm. involved in, in kind of presenting Lake Peter to the world. And he has the most incredible book or even number of books, I think, that that really hold testament to the majesty of what it was. And I don't think anybody photographed it more than him. And he did that in the most beautiful, thoughtful, deeply engaging way with his family and his children in the photographs and he made it very personable and accessible and and he was part of a lot of you know groups of people that went in there regularly to celebrate it and and they even flew in and landed on the beaches there um and so melva just passed away was it last year uh i think yeah 2021 uh, yeah last year yeah i used to spend a bit of time with her over the years She, she was always really engaged with um Liz Travoskis, and, and she had a, had a, she actually went out as part of the, um, I remember getting invited on, the, on this last trip and, and Melba was coming out to Lake Peta to do a bit of a demonstration and a, and a celebratory kind of education sort of day um, around not that long before, actually. I think it was only a month or two before uh, from memory. It's, COVID's a bit of a blur, but, but anyway, it ties around that story of just how special it was to, to meet her out on the track and share company given, given what Tabitha is so involved with now. Absolutely. Um, I guess also it'd be good to see some um, of your other work for around the um, state, Tabitha, and maybe even mainland if you've got some, if you would, would like to maybe show some of your favourite shots and um, have, you can talk a little bit yeah. about some of your adventures. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it's actually something um, that I've kind of been working on. It's good good place to start I suppose um when you're going out to to photograph places I guess early in the morning or late at night it does involve a lot of walking in the dark and your head torch becomes the greatest tool that you have for quite a long time um (laughs) so yeah (laughs) um just getting this up so I was sort of contemplating how to do things a little bit differently in terms of you know, landscape photography and how to, I don't know, different things that we don't always necessarily consider. Um, So one of the things, obviously, by a head torch, some of the things that you see first before the sun actually comes up in the morning. So not the best shot, but um, in terms of the Tasmanian wilderness areas, anyone that's been into the Alpine area would kind of, uh, recognize it, the skeletal pines, but it is quite moody in it. Um, I think being early in the morning, it, it adds a different atmosphere to the picture and, and makes you appreciate it a little bit differently. What sort um, of area was this taken, if you don't mind saying? So, <laughs> yeah, this was taken um, up near Leonard's Tarn. If you're familiar, with that, it's um, just off the overland track into the, the back of the mountain regions, kind of between Thetis and Achilles. Right. Um, so, yeah, huge fire that's gone through there and just a lot of the ancient vegetation, as we know, doesn't uh, recover anytime particularly soon. Um, yes, I just want to check that the picture changed. Yep, yep. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, cool, great. <laughs> um, and obviously another great thing is the full moon. I just find walking through the Tasmanian wilderness early in the morning under the full moon, there's something really magical about it. Oh, yeah. And I, I don't, you never feel kind of, or personally, I never feel particularly scared in that kind of situation because you always feel like you belong in this space and you're really a part of the environment. So, And I guess we don't yeah, have bears seeing, or anything else that are going to jump out, do we? Um, so that, that's always nice. No, like Normally you might get an aggressive there. brush-tailed possum. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, just seeing different places, you know, even if it's an iconic place that everyone recognizes like Cradle Mountain and Dove Lake, but in a totally different and a new still light. And I mean, for me, particularly in this spot, um, you know, the stars are still out. You, the Currawongs were already calling. It's like 5 a.m. But, um, you know, there's no other people around or nothing else to disturb it. And that's somewhere that that's really rare. Um, at the moment so a lot of it I guess a lot of my work for me is also uh, kind of an emotional attachment to the place as well because I was one of the kids that was privileged to you know you go and have a 
picnic in the back of the car at the Dove Lake car park and you're overlooking this this beautiful scene, which is, yeah, not something that can happen um, so much anymore. Yeah, and so, also just have, seeing the reflections like that. I mean, the most perfect reflections. You don't see that all that often when you're at Cradle. Oh, it's so rare. Mm. Okay. Um, So I guess that's, yeah, just a little something I've been working on. I honestly um, kind of want to build on that and, and show something else and really focus a lot more attention on that. So please yeah. don't critique those ones because it's just <laughs> a little <laughs> um, starting I, I, project. I, yeah, I've thought a lot of walking in the dark. It, it, it's it's always hard to describe the immersiveness it feels, the sounds and the smells become a lot more of a part of the experience and during the day because they, they take over and, so to get accentuated as one of the senses and just going back to that pine shot, like I don't, people don't realize 60% oh. of Tasmania's alpine flora and fauna is found nowhere else on earth. And it's very significant, the threat of fire and the fact that some of the most beautiful species like the pencil pines, they're so slow growing and they're literally much, literally so incredibly vulnerable to fire. And, and once it comes through, they're, they're gone forever. Yeah, and this place in the pictures sort of highlights that every time there's a big fire coming through its fire season, um, I just get so worried for for um, walls of Jerusalem, um, just in terms of, um, you know, this. I think it's probably got the largest pencil pine forest in the world, and, and the thought of um, a big fire going through there is um, is uh, hard to hard to bear actually. And you can see some of the pines on the edge of the lake over there. Yeah, mm. that we're referring to as well. So it's and they have such personality. It's almost like mm. they're characters out of Lord of the Rings, and they are ants ready to sort of talk to you if you do the wrong thing. Like they they have a real ancient sort of wisdom about them, and uh, and they don't get too big. So they they sort of or they're not overwhelming. They they're slow growing and and wonderfully aged, and they're often positioned in some of the most magnificently beautiful places as oh. well. Yeah, I've, um, when I was at the walls once, I found uh, some that were, uh, they must have been hundreds of years old and, and they were so old that they sort of grew out and then up. So you could actually kind of walk into the middle of this tree, um, even though it was, yeah, had all of the branches going around it. And um, I don't know, it's just like a, they've got some sort of ancient presence that you you can sort of almost tap into it's a very unusual feeling and and it doesn't sound uh doesn't sound like um right to hear that but when you actually there and see these things um yeah that there's there's a lot of character there that's for sure mm. yeah it's, it's a really interesting um point about that kind of ancient being and i wonder if that's part of um well i think it's part of how I feel when I'm walking into these places, if you're alone and you're somewhere really remote, but you never feel lonely because it's, it is somewhere that's been inhabited for, for so long and, you know, longer than you know, basically anywhere else on earth. It's one of the oldest places with the oldest vegetation. And it, it does just feel like there's an other and you're just kind of among ancient friends in so many different ways. It's, oh, nicely put, Tabitha. That's a beautiful way to explain it. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Like the the pencil pines are have to be one of my favorite types of vegetation in Tasmania because they do they grow so straight, but then they grow in all these beautiful curving features and then somehow shoot up really straight again at the end. So the, the diversity of of different shapes and and the characters of the trees, as you say, all in this area are, are quite amazing. But I guess when I go out, I never go out with the intention of taking a specific photograph or achieving any certain result in a certain location, always with the exception of this one particular photograph. And I'd always thought in the back of my mind, I'm going to go up to the walls, get up really early, walk up there, and it would just be perfect if there was this glowing sunrise and crystal clear reflection, and it actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> it was just absolutely perfect. However. If you ever see this photo used on the ABC on their little um, news headline, um, you know, online app, it comes up with a little feature image at the top. Yeah. It always means that something bad is going to be announced. Every yeah. time they use it, it's for bad news. <laughs> it's such a <laughs> letdown. <laughs> Did you tag them once or something when you posted it online? Because they have a habit of using those. Um, once you... I must have done. Yeah. 
Uh, that's happened to yeah. me too. And, um, yeah. Island is always where I come up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully for good news. But <laughs> um, yeah, so that's one of my favourite shots just purely because I got lucky and it all actually worked out far better than intended. But um, something else that I kind of like focusing on is just really fleeting moments of light. Like um, technically it's not the most perfect shot if you put it into a judging capacity, but it's a favourite from a lot of people. I think just because of the uniqueness and the slightly um, different part where you've just got the mist rising off the top of the hill and it just caught the sunlight for this mm. split. It was, it was like for maybe 10 seconds and just trying to capture that um, in the right spot and offering something a, a little bit different. But mm. Yeah, no, from, from, from a judging point of view, I'd probably disagree with you there because uh, you just explained all the oh. reasons why it's a standout image. Like it almost looks like, you know, Bridal Vale Falls looks, you know, with that, yeah. that few minutes of light sort of it's such an unusual point of, of separation and kind of mystery and, and compositionally you've got this beautiful lateral flow and this gorgeous texture and this wonderful atmospherics all at the same time. It's a really striking image. I quite like the um, sort of elliptical shape of the blue patch in the cloud above as well. It's sort of a nice um, sort of frame um, as well. It, it sits in there so nicely. So, yeah, beautiful. Maybe I need to enter more competitions. That's the moral <laughs> of the story. <laughs> that, that spontaneous um, which is so just key to Tasmania's changeable weather, hey, and just mm. landscape photography in general is something yeah. I really advocate for personally is just being really adaptable and open to whatever you get presented with because at the end of the day, you've got no control over what you, you know, what nature gives you when it comes to weather and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, no, it's cool to see that, you know, that's resulted in a couple of your favourite shots. Um because yeah, no, I think it's 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 the best. <laughs> it's the I most. really love this one. Um, yeah. I'm a, a, we'll say what you want about pencil pines, but um, it's hard for me to go past a good pandani. Yeah, <laughs> um, and um, <laughs> just such a good lead in here from the left. Um, to, in, like using the the um leaves to to take you in, and yeah, uh, it's just a yeah great great um nice some um, red tips on the leaves too. They don't always go like that, so that's quite a nice highlight as well. Yeah. And they're also indigenous to Tasmania. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the, um, the little, uh, plant. light coming through the falling rain off in the top right as well. Is that actually is that iridescent? Is there a rainbow like in a that? Burger there. Yeah, there is just a tiny little bit. So it's actually great you talk about fleeting moments in the weather. This was from crossing the iron bounds on that um, south coast trip that I was talking about, mm. and it was yeah horrific weather. But it was like there was a hand kind of following me across the range, and I just got this kind of beautiful traverse but it, everywhere around me was just completely wild so yeah. um yeah it's, it's, the story behind the image is exactly what you're saying <laughs> the, um, the, amount, the amount of stories i've heard about about iron, ironbound crossings it's, yeah it's kind of synonymous with with some sort of weather event that place i don't know what what it's all about but it's quite consistent mm. yeah it's definitely got a reputation that precedes it that's for sure <laughs> Yeah, slide slide your way down the back end oh, of the iron bounds. This reminds me of a sheet. I was with Ben at this um place. It must be Rainbow Central here. I feel like most yeah. photos I see of Coal Bay and the hazards, there's rainbows. Like I've seen <laughs> like I've seen like four shots in the last few years of a double rainbow at this spot. And I, I don't know what it is about Coal Bay and rainbows, but it, it's it's well, this a, is a pretty it's, pretty special. No one, complaints though. from me. <laughs> so vivid in the in the um yeah how, how it's just come out here yeah when i went through your website just before tabitha this one was a real standout for me uh just the atmospherics and, and the oh. space mm. space you've given them to be the present and just it's very rare to get a double rainbow like that as well mm. especially right in the middle mm. of your pump <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 i was really lucky enough to live in coles bay for um, a couple of years prior to the pandemic. And oh, wow. the, the irony was it hardly rained when I was there. It was in a serious drought. So this was seriously amazing to actually capture. Um, I think the, the freakiest thing ever happened is I, I was doing a traverse around the big three-day loop and, and we got snowed on. Mm. What? Uh, no, hey. was, it's never happened since. This is ooh, maybe 18 years ago or something. And 
And we took it like an hour and a half. Like it was trying to settle on the ground just as we were going over sort of Mount Graham and Freysenay and coming down into uh, into wine glass. And it was there were still flakes as we were coming down into wine glass. Yeah, wow. I had that once in the Three wow. Popes track as well. Um, and so it, it does happen snow at sea level, but it um, doesn't normally settle too long. I think it was on this day or yesterday that it snowed in Hobart and someone skied down the um, the, the um, Tasman Bridge. So oh, wow. <laughs> so the time of year for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I know people that have skied over the Tasman Bridge. Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah. Before well, time. This is incredible. Is this West wow. Coast? So where, where are we? This, this is, this yeah, is so Mount Murchison. So I actually don't know the name of the impoundment that it's reflecting on. Um, but this was sort of one of those trips up to Tsukina. And the, again, the weather had been terrible for days. I had hardly taken my camera out. And I was just about to leave, like, you know, camped nearby and then just got up really early in the morning and thought, I'm going to go and see if this clears and there's a really beautiful sunrise. And there was. It was absolutely perfect. And it was my birthday. So oh. it was meant to be. It's <laughs> <laughs> oh, amazing. And I love the how you can get that sort of just disturbed water in the in the back there just to sort of create a little divide mm-hmm. or separator there as well just to um take that highlight off the of the sky there it's obviously lovely. lucky yeah yeah mm-hmm. it's sort of otherwise it would just kind of blend into one as a sort of a bit of big dark mass wouldn't it mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah and i think it's kind of uh i guess a, a lesser known um or a lesser thought of part of the the tarkon if you're talking about it from a campaign or conservation perspective we often just um, people immediately think of the coast or just the forests, but there are, you know, these select few mountains in the area that are part of it as well. And obviously um, a little bit further inland and south, there's also the the Tyndall Range, which um, is not part of the, the World Heritage Area that um, could be as well. So there's, yeah, these magnificent icons that, um, yeah, if you great just to get some more you know photographs out into the world and share with that part of it and another um, one um, just nearby to mount reed with um some hue and pines on it too which is um just the most inc- i've been very fortunate to get in there and um you know these hue and pines i think they're the highest altitude pines uh maybe the most uh westerly um or, or something there's, there's some sort of stat about them but yeah there's, there's some pretty pretty amazing little spots there in the mountains there yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, again, uh, this was actually um, after that morning shot of Dove Lake where the reflection was going up. And I was quite surprised actually that there was much Vegas left. It was quite late in May. I mean, you can see where there's a fair portion of it that has fallen, but I'm incredibly unlucky trying to get. Um, any sort of sunrise around cradle. The weather there is extraordinarily fickle, as you all very much aware, and this is probably the closest that I've ever come. Um, again, it's probably not one of my favourite personal shots, but it's one that a lot of other people seem to like. I think cradle in itself is not quite sharp enough. It's a little bit um, overcast just in the immediate part of the sky above it. But, um, yeah, it's... Perhaps it's just because it's cradle people seem to like it and have an association with it. I'm not sure. Must have done well um, oh, if you're at Dove Lake or at the boat shed and um, pre-dawn and then up there for some colour. You, you, you had to put your <laughs> skates on, I think, to get up there. Did you get up there this year? I I did the overland track in late April. Oh, so, really? yeah. It, um, that, was, that was Vegas through there. Yeah, it was good. Um, a lot of it had already dropped because we had that, you know, really windy patch just before Easter. Yeah, yeah it was And, good. yeah, there was just that awful little weekend of weather just beforehand. So I think it, it had just passed its prime. On the sort of western plateau, um, as you're looking across to Barn Bluff from that backside of Cradle, it was really quite rich through there. But, um, yeah, the, the weather um, was far from um, perfect when we were crossing there. Every other day of the trip, the weather was crystal clear, blue skies, 
not a breath of wind, but just that first day it really tested it. It was, you know, one of those days where it's just the wind is blowing so hard. You really wonder if you're going to be able to stand up with a full pack on or if you're just going to turtle it and that's the end of your trip yeah. already. <laughs> and that, that's one of the more exposed parts of the whole trip as well. So it's, yeah. Mm. Having been, yeah. guide, having been a guide on that trap, it's always the first day that makes me the most nervous. <laughs> Getting people up, chain. Yeah, well, that's I mean, it's a big stress test, isn't it? To see if people can actually, um, you know, carry the pack and do all the gear and, and that kind of thing. It's probably one of the mm-hmm. elevation gainy sort of days too. But yeah, no, it's... Yeah, yeah it's, and, um, it's exposure on the back of the plateau as well when you're coming around. It's sort of... Oh, it can be fair right there. But yeah, mm-hmm. just to get conditions like this... Um, at, Cradle is, is a bit of a dream and there's, there's I'm sure there's a lot of people that have visited Cradle a few times and, and not managed to to get such crystal clear reflections and, and beautiful so, sky colour. Tabitha, uh, so do yourself a favour and have a look at Luke's Instagram and what he managed to get up on, on the on the upper edges of Cradle uh, during that same time you were there was, uh, was world class and unbelievable. So... Oh, yeah, was a, that was um I, I think you mentioned the good weather you had there was a there's such an incredible patch of good weather um at the back end of april mm. i just hadn't experienced um three or four days in a row just beautiful crystal clear skies and uh yeah it was um yeah you get lucky sometimes and that, that you, you got to make the most of it so yeah, yeah and during that same period there was you know a huge strong vibrant aurora mm. as well for yeah. i guess two nights of the trip so that was yeah pretty special to have that clear weather and an aurora as well at the same time yeah yeah it's very rare very um unfrequent yeah. to have um a, you know a, a new moon or or dark skies with with clear skies and and such calm weather so yeah very fortunate it's one, one of those times where you look back on and and i'm very grateful to have the ability to get out there and, and explore mm. the atmosphere yeah. is astonishing tabitha where, where, mm. where are we here um, so this is actually looking down on the the forest at Mount Field from uh, just nearby the Seal Lookout right. as you head up to the ski fields and the Rodway Range. Yeah. Um, again, sunrise first thing in the morning. Um, yeah, just the light that came over um, from the fog that you know you kind of get the inversion through the the forest layers were really quite magnificent. Must have had an early start but, to get up there for um, sunrise. Yeah. Yeah. I've yeah. Seen <laughs> I didn't see the shot anything like this from that area, Tabitha. Me either. I wouldn't have picked that as Mount Field. Yeah. Oh, never, never. Yeah. I had a bit of an idea that perhaps it would be a good spot for the sunrise. And it's a pretty straightforward, I guess, track to sort of get up there. It's not too challenging if you're going early in the morning. So this was actually, I guess, the panorama of the whole. Oh, wow. thing and the, the forest that we were looking at were kind of further over this other side yeah. um on the right hand side of the screen there but yeah one of the most magnificent sunrises that you've kind of ever experienced there's a lot going on in the panorama but it it really shows uh, all the different aspects and components that sort of happened with the it, that perfect vibrant golden hour light reflections in lake seal at the bottom there and then the the forests to the side yeah the uh, the beams coming through that fog in that previous shot was lovely um so mm. like just so many great details within that that yeah telephoto galore <laughs> out of a field day with conditions like that it'd be so much fun so no that's awesome it looks like you're um also hiking then with a, a wide angle and a telephoto as well do you have a sort of a, a setup of choice when it comes to focal length uh, uh choices <laughs> Yeah, I, I always carry the uh, wide angle with me, um, but also uh, what is it? it's a, a 50 to 250 mil as well. Yep. I have got the most basic base model set up in the world. It's actually quite embarrassing. It's <laughs> just a, a Canon 760D and Tamron lenses that I've had for a really long time. Um, I've shot in film for a seriously long time just on an omd um olympus so yeah digital is a bit of a transition <laughs> no it's good and no, it's i mean the images that matter not the gear yeah absolutely yeah that's right the best camera is the one you've got on you right <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right i think it was um, just a nice 
fairly light kit too. I, I had I had a lot of early um, Tamron lenses for a long time as well with a basic, basic Canon kit, and I, I got so many good images out of them. Yeah. It's one of those yeah, funny absolutely. things, actually. You can you can drop thousands and thousands of dollars on gear, but when you're looking at the photos in the day, um, it's not like you can actually generally tell. Oh, that was shot with camera X or camera Y, is it? It's um, mm. it's, I wouldn't have even thought that that was the case. Um, based on the shots that you were showing, so it's it's quite interesting to hear that. So, yeah, that's oh, this is a, a stunner. I think this is the one we chose for our thumbnail, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that cloud inversion is something else. Just how it's like translucent, like it's not just totally opaque, but you can see through mm. to those trees in the sort of mid-ground, um, like sort of below that strip, how there's, it's kind of like, yeah, this milky layer over them, but you can still see through, but it still provides all that lovely atmosphere. Um, it's such a cool mm. little thing in there. Um, and yeah, just a beautiful view as well. Beautiful light. Um, yeah, so many great details in that. Yeah, I love seeing. Mm. I think I know where that is. I love seeing it when it's in that sort of scenario, um, and often hard to pull over and try and um, find some time to 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 be able to get a shot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. No, it's absolutely beautiful. Yeah, in the up in Florentine mm. Valley there, but um, so oh, I don't know if that's the right one but yeah um so a really obvious um match area on in the duquesne range mm -hmm. there um I'd have to say that um, Jerrion's got to be my favourite. It's between Jerrion or Barn Bluff for me for the favourite mountain in Tassie. I don't know. Do you have a favourite? Mm -hmm. I think the, I mean, the hazards range as a whole. I oh, think yeah. definitely, but I'm I'm biased because I've spent so um, long there looking um, at them all. So yeah, I think they're yeah really quite iconic. But actually, to be honest, the other one that I really quite enjoy is um, Pelion West. Oh. I just think you can't really go past it when you're you know on the overland track. It kind of, it's just because it looks the same from every direction and I, I think it's a really good kind of waypoint to know where you are and where you're coming from and, and how far you've got to go on a particular walk yeah yeah and it's one of the tallest too i think isn't it one, i think it's in the top five or something like the, like that, yeah it? like the, the fourth highest i think maybe yeah. yeah yeah definitely so um yeah just a, another really kind of precious sunrise photo from um Mount also just with the, I guess, with the much softer morning colours. Well, it's a pretty decent effort doing sunrise up there. Respect there. <laughs> Do you sleep with Tabitha? I was just like, what time do you go to bed? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I guess often um, too when you're um when you're up in these parts, it's it, it is summer because you don't really want to be up there in winter unless you really know what you're doing and and have a good weather window. So it means that your sunrises are especially you know this time of morning. It you know it's probably five in the morning or something like that. So um yeah you, you you're going you're not getting a lot of sleep. Um but um it's it's definitely worth it when you see things like this. Yeah, definitely autumn, autumn and springtime are kind of the ideal time whether it's you, the weather's a, a little bit kinder, it's not quite freezing cold, yeah. but you're not waiting super early for the sun to Yeah. 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 Um, oh, goodness. Yeah, this is probably my favourite photo from this year. Um, yeah, just getting the, the different hues coming through and it wasn't, uh, at a traditional time of day that you would expect to see that kind of light that actually this was on um oh, apologies it was the last day of last year so it wasn't this year at all um before the massive thunderstorm came through uh, over the the gordon and, and petter impoundments that started the the bushfire at bonnets bay on the petter impoundment that we had at the start of this year so a lot of the the orange sort of hues that you can see throughout the image were sort of coming as a part of that storm and the, the sunlight that was peeping through the clouds from it. So it was something quite different to be experiencing and um, definitely not conditions I would advocate for being on a, a high hill on ever mm. to any, again, it was the most unfortunate spot to get caught, but I've 
never seen a storm come in so quickly, so fast and um, be so thick in that that situation. And then it completely dissipated really quickly. And um, that evening was absolutely crystal clear. Mm. Yeah, wow. So what did you do to cover uh, for the storm in that case? Did you quickly set up tents or just put your pack, your rain shell on and just take cover? Um, no, um, actually there was a couple of rocks <laughs> with like a good little cave and I thought that's going to be the place to go because I don't know about putting up tents when you know that there's a thunderstorm coming. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, I've got a little dog that's having a bark in the background. <laughs> yeah, with tent poles and that sort of thing. So, yeah, just getting natural cover really seemed like the best idea. Yeah. No, I absolutely love um, mountain shots. And I actually sort of thought a little more about your setup and um, it also would mean that it's extremely lightweight, which is a, a huge asset. And I even saw, um, you know, uh, uh, Grant Dixon, who's a big friend of the shows and um, he, he um, is shooting with APS-C uh, cameras uh, precisely to keep the weight down as well. So it's um, there's actually quite a lot to be said for, um, to, to, you know, um, not do what I do and have full frame, big big lenses and everything, but actually really cut it down and and actually be able to get out there and and get these sort of shots. So especially um having a long lens that can really zoom in and get those layers, it's amazing. Yeah, the one yeah, I, I, two kilo hundred to four hundred is a <laughs> <laughs> always a bit of a struggle to lug along, but it's also hard to not <laughs> do when you get such beautiful distant mountain oh, layers no. as well. So yeah. it's. Yeah, <laughs> such a debate all the time. What gear? Oh, nightmare. Yeah. I've been very fortunate to have a um, super lightweight tripod. It was just extraordinary. It was super cheap <laughs> thing, but it was absolutely perfect how it packed down and weighed absolutely nothing. Mm. And then um, this shot from the Eastern Arthurs is actually when it died going up Moss Ridge and I should have known better to pack it inside my pack and I didn't because we were in a rush <laughs> mm. yeah the bits that um fell off and succumbed to the scrub were unfortunately irreparable for the tripod <laughs> oh no I was up um in the East Arthurs earlier this year and it, it, that's um anyone that can get anywhere in that that mountain range um is a it's, I don't know if there's too many places that get too much um, more um, gnarly than than up there. So um, yeah, that's um, it's hard to even yeah put put into words some of the the stuff you have to go through to to get anywhere. But um, yeah, no, well done, well done. Did you get up yeah. to uh, Fetters? Yeah, I did. Um, I actually was up there with um, Louis Taylor, who did that oh, wow. um, fantastic piece in um, yeah. Nat Geo with recently. So, yeah. Um, yeah, he's a super good friend and needed someone for his Federation Peak mission. So I uh, agreed to go up there with him. So we were oh. doing, yeah, Moss Ridge in the dark as well. <laughs> yeah, he's on those and, t t t tight timelines, yes. And did he um, – Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not um, – I'm definitely a photographer that bushwalks, not a bushwalker that photographs, if you put it that way. Um, had, <laughs> like, I, when I – I did a walk with him up Mount Anne, um, and it's just like um, the all of the rocks and everything you go over is just like an escalator for him or something. It just some, seems to have <laughs> – be able to just end up uh, – did you find the same thing or was it just me? <laughs> Um, I mean, I mean, his height is definitely helpful, <laughs> particularly going up Moss Ridge. Yeah. But I, I mean, it was mountain. I think 107 or 117 for him. Yeah. So I was keeping up, but that that was definitely because I hadn't climbed 107 or 117 mountains in as many days prior to Federation. <laughs> yeah. So those watching, just a bit of background. Um, Louis Taylor is um. Uh, it's what you'd refer to as an ableist. And so he um, has climbed 158 of the 158 ables in 158 days, um, which is quite an achievement because, um, yeah, as you can see here, it's it's um, not always the easiest um, terrain that you're encountering uh, at all. Um, and Fed Peak is one of the most formidable climbs um, you can can think of. I, I really don't know if I could personally do it, but um, yeah, so that, that, that's definitely... I think that's the single most exposed piece of... Um bushwalking rock in the entire of australia mm. and that scares the crap out of me like <laughs> it's a yeah. two is a two thousand foot drop i believe 
Yeah, right down to Lake Jeeves, I think, or something and, like that. Uh, but... There's nothing that's going to stop you. <laughs> I've been looking at that face for 25 years, and it's just one step too far for me to take on. But uh, hats off to the people that do. It, it's it's not an uncommonly crossed um, area, funny enough, given the what. It, but it's, that says as much about Tasmanian bush, bushwalkers as anything else. Well, it's more rock climbing, really, when you get into that that scenario, isn't it? I mean, it's it's, it's um not a lot of walking it's more just scaling and navigating and and um yeah being careful <laughs> well it, it's one thing that to to be exposed to a fall it's another thing to know that if you fall you will die mm. uh, not like you might get hurt it's like you you fall off that you you you're dead <laughs> it's like coming back and i'm like oh do i need to risk that it's oh it's a nice mountain but you know Anyway, I don't want to talk too many no, people. Watching, lots, um, lots of people do it. It's it's not you know un, untenable or anything, but psychologically, and it's got a bit going on. I remember watching um Daniel Clark's um stories of when he was attempting um yeah feta and uh, yeah it was too much me just watching the stories. I I I, uh, I can get in my own head when it comes to you know really exposed bits and even just doing the day two of the Mount Ann circuit, um, we had pretty perfect weather and um, that gets relatively gnarly at times, but nothing like um, Federation peak. Mm. Uh, but even that I was, I was getting pretty stressed. Um, it's less of an ability thing and more of a mental thing. And they're just, yeah, it freaks me out too much. Um, so yeah, I, props to you guys. That's a huge effort and um, yeah, well done. <laughs> And I, yeah, stuff doing must in the dark. Go, go, go on, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely not bush walking at that point. Not, cannot be compared at all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but yeah, somewhere, somewhere a little bit um, more relaxing. <laughs> um, yeah, back on the overland track. Um, yeah, just another personal favourite to, to look through the, uh, I guess, iconic Tasmanian vegetation and pandanning. Um, I think there's something really special about them. They seem to have their own little personalities, kind of similar to pencil pine, but, um, yeah, different as well. You can walk through sections and as it gets thicker and thicker, you kind of feel like there's people enclosing in on you. And, yeah, they're just absolutely fantastic. Um I always find really creepy vegetation. when you're in a spot where there's the big tall ones and, and you're sort of out in the open and <laughs> it feels like there's these people around you. It's yes, yeah, definitely agree with that. Is that Cathedral Mountain yeah. back there too? It is. Yeah. 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 So um, it's this is kind of on the slopes of um, Pelion East where there's quite a lot of it. the vegetation really changes from when you're heading from uh, like the Mount Oakley side up to the gap there and then it's just quite open and exposed and then as you drop down and there's uh, a lot more of this you know, Gondwana relic alpine vegetation on that side it's a really special but it's such a stark change um, on the walk along there um, now you're really making I'm me want to get back on the track again <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely no um, and so the Other part, then. sorry. Oh, wow. Should oh, be. I think I recognize that peak too. Um, that Machaputri, how do you pronounce it? It is indeed. Um, have you got, oh, sorry. I've got something different from you guys. Sorry. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. <laughs> right. That should be much better. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. So um, managed to sneak some actual time off work earlier this year and head over to Nepal and do a little bit of walking around. Very jealous. Gorapani, Poon Hill, and the Annapurna Base Camp as well, which is a, wow. um, yeah, yeah. Very, very special part of the world, very different part of the world. I've spent a bit of time in Nepal, um, maybe 
six or seven years ago at a higher altitude, but it's, um, yeah, really changed with climate change how walking in the area is and um, it's they've actually just introduced legislation that groups have to have a, a guide or a porter with them and I think that's really essential. Um, obviously, it's good for their economy and it's good for the tourists to have a local guide there with you as well, but the um, increase in avalanche, the unseasonal rains that would come in and um, you know, all these different risks that are, would generally be really hard to mitigate if you weren't familiar with the climate um, normally, but let alone when they're unpredictable for the for the locals as well. So it was, yeah, quite an interesting experience to be there um, and see how it's changed. But was really lucky to have a few hours of good weather every morning in the mountains and capture how how they were and yeah, something different from. Um, Tasmania. I just wanted to check that the picture changed for you all as well. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It says ah, a very the, um, mystical yeah. kind of feeling about it. Drift off the top. Oh, if you ever get a chance to, to get over there and hike in the Himalayas, it's um, and it's not as probably as challenging as it might sound if you if you pick a particular track. Um, that generally speaking, mm -hmm. I did the Annapurna circuit and. And that you know, it's a, it's a, it's not like mountaineering at all. Or well, there's certain sections when you're going over the big high mountain passes, they can be quite a bit more challenging. But generally speaking, um, it's more altitude you're dealing with. Um, and um, if you can put one foot after the other um, over a long period of time, um, then um, yeah, you'll you'll be able to get there. And um, what you see mm -hmm. is, um, I I um, if I want to close my eyes and and think of a place where um, I just you know um, feel at ease and peace, um, quite often I'll end up um, in the in the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's um, a pretty special kind of um, environment. I think it's the Tibetan Buddhist um, culture as well, with all of the um, the the prayer flags and the 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 uh, prayer wheels and, and different things like that, mm. that, um, that really uh, highlighted it for me as well. Definitely um, a special place. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think the, the people there are so warm and welcoming and it's, it's such a special, um, I, and not only land to, to be passing through, but the people that you meet there are, uh, I dare I say the friendliest in the world. <laughs> really, really special. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. All right. Um, yeah. Do you have um, a few other shots or do you want to, um, any uh, other things to talk about? Um, yeah, look, I've just got some of, um, here's a couple of, because I am seriously biased to this place. <laughs> of Freycinet, although um, you all have some that are very, very similar. I'm not sure how oh, wow. well this one will come through on the screen because it's very different printed. Um, it's a bit of an art not getting it completely uh, oversaturated or, or blown out with the whites in it. It's um, Yeah, definitely spend an awful lot of time playing around with long exposure and, and along different areas of the coastline up in Freycinet. Um, yeah, there's probably an area like that, that vantage point is probably not a, a classic vantage point that you would see a uh, photograph from. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess particularly around if you're shooting anything of the night time, um, yeah, be it the aurora or, um, say, bioluminescence, oh. <laughs> trying not to get the lights of the lodge and that sort of thing in as well is really difficult. There's lots of boats and, yeah. That's yeah. unreal. That's wow. some awesome bio. The detail you've got in the wave there as well. Was it a relatively short exposure? It was, um, yeah, pretty short. Off the top of my head, I'm going to say like, uh, oh, probably min, probably about 15 seconds, I think. Yeah. No, it would, it would have to be less for the wave. But, um, mm. yeah, just an incredibly special evening mm. to be out there. And then to get the Milky Way positioned in the same spot at the same time, complete fluke. Really great. That's um, and, uh, 
I, I've seen photographs uh, from around there with bio, but um, I, I've just never. I think we even went up there one time, Paul, trying to chase the bio, but um, had no luck. But um, yeah, we did. It was it's all really there. one of those phenomena oh, where um, you just have to really be um at, at the right place at the right time. And normally, by the time someone else um like mentions it, it's it's gone. It's a bit convenient in some ways, but I guess they want to have it all to themselves and not have a hundred people there around them trying to get the same <laughs> shot. So. Yeah, oh, well, it's one of the big advantages if you can live there and have spend some time there, I guess. Yeah, amazing. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I think local knowledge on where the bio is best is is key to <laughs> the success for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, awesome. um, well, um. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for um, your time tonight and and um, sharing your work with us. And um, we're definitely very, um, uh, you know, inspired, I suppose, to get to some certain spots. I know that um, it jogged a lot of memories for me that um, I'm, you know, keen to get back and see and um, I also hear a bit about the work that it is that you're doing as well. And uh, it's very um, special things that you're doing and, and trying to uh, achieve um, and, you know, protecting the environment's never an easy thing. There's a lot of um, people that um, aren't really uh, too keen on on uh, change or, or going back to how things used to be in a way. So, um, yeah, um, you know, keep it, keep it going, hey? Hmm. We still have a little bit of talk. Tabitha, would you be interested in speaking a little bit about some of your inspirations, either, either people or, or artists or even other photographers you feel like you, you've bounced stuff or come across or met in person or, or been inspired? Mm -hmm or look, look or, or look to yeah. or work with yeah absolutely I mean obviously uh, Alegis Trahanis is someone that I have spent a lot of time looking at his work I think it was through that um you know we mentioned the book before the world of Alegis Trahanis which was produced by watercolorist Max Angus after Alegis's tragic death and all the works in that, not just of Lake Pedda, but the entire of the Southwest, I guess, really showed me what was out there and what, what could be seen. And in a way, it sort of inspired me to visit the areas and then the photography was sort of a byproduct of that, if that makes sense. You've got an interesting think, story actually about um uh, Trikanas. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but um yeah. with the um with this particular show, I think the only time we've ever not run this show on a, a Wednesday night was when we actually there was a screening of um Alagus's um slideshow. Um and it just happened to be on a Wednesday night at the same time we we're recording the show. It was a very new show and fresh show at the time. So we actually rescheduled the show so we could <laughs> see um so, so we could see the uh slideshow um being presented. Uh, I think um, a lot of people are very keen to see it, including us. So um, certainly, um, yeah, amazing um, photographs and, and uh, yeah, so certainly um, been a factor in our show in the past. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And and so deserving, I think, um, Paul, you were saying how Alayas captures things with a, an element of emotion. And the, the way that he can capture different or he caught different uh, immersions in the fog in the mountains was um, different to, to anything else that I'd sort of seen at, at the time. So I definitely get excited and perhaps a bit nostalgic when I see that actually happening, <laughs> um, you know, in front of my eyes when I'm out walking. And so I, I perhaps I lean the way to capturing that sort of thing because of that influence. But Early on and, and looking at different conservation campaigns, you're obviously the other person you look to is Peter Dromboskis, and I'm always interested. Um, obviously, Peter Dromboskis captured Rock Island Bend, which was played a major part in saving the Franklin River in that campaign a, a decade after Lake Pedder was lost. And how Lake Pedder doesn't quite have its Rock Island Bend hero image, there's a lot of images that kind of show the the iconic lake from a different position but it doesn't have yet we haven't yet found that one image that it captures people's emotions uh, as well as depicting what special place it is so um yeah kind of two parts to that firstly yes yeah, it's going to be quite amazing we we get people that bring slides to the campaign all the time and so we can sort of learn, um, you know, rescan them and have a look at different aspects of the environment in the area and see 
you know, what's going to be that that kind of Rock Island Bend moment? Is there going to be one or is it just a series of images that depict that lake? And and the second part is actually looking at Peter's work and through a large format um, camera, how he would, you know, the full frame and capturing the, uh, I guess, the icon shot in the in the background, but leading into the the foreground and having something that, that kind of captured the whole image and, and how that was really different from what Alagas had and kind of comparing the two. So, um, yeah, I kind of, it's, it's just something that's consciously instilled in me um, and partially why I take sort of the, the wide angle, not having a full frame lens camera, just to, to capture that full picture when I am out there. Mm. Yeah, because they, they, they had very different um, styles, didn't they? For for um, I guess Dombrovskis, um, st- of, I guess the understudy in a way of Lagos, and and but he, you know Lagos was much more of a documentarian sort of style, and and um, Dombrovskis is much more considered and and maybe a bit more intimate in his uh, portraits that he or, or portraits of nature, I suppose. Um, so it certainly, um, yeah kind of they they uh, sit together quite nicely actually when you kind of see the the different styles that they had there and and would be two very um, great inspirations to have um in that in you know to 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 work from there so that's awesome yeah it must be amazing having access to some of those historical images that few people would have ever seen and having a reason you know for people to sort of dig deep in their archives and Go back to it because it's such a phenomenal history of bushwalkers in Tasmania, and that are like eight years old and can outwalk any of us. It, it's just <laughs> blows me away. Uh, when I first went to the Hobart, Hobart Bushwalking Club, I was just like, "Oh my god, I think I'm 50 years younger than anybody else in this room." And and as soon as we went out, I realised I could outwalk the pants out of me about 10 times over, and ended up doing like police search and rescue stuff with them, and they where they just did all the hard volunteered to do all the hardest trips. But my point is that there's a wonderful legacy both in people like Alagas and Peter, but there's also all the people around him that knew, knew them mm. when they were alive and went on trips with them or were inspired directly during some of the campaigns that they were involved in, especially Alagas, because Alagas filled out the Hobart City Hall more than anyone I think ever has historically with his work. And and that was that show, you know, we wanted to see one of those shows that was the very thing that that stopped the city for the night and brought everybody in and, and I think uh, Lagos was, I think Luke's on the money, I'd say he's a bit more of a documentarian, but when I said there's a lot of personality in his photographs, you know, the big distinction I see in Peter and Lagos's work very clearly is there's no people in Peter's work ever. Uh, mm. You'll never see a human being in there. He was he was a real component for the purity of wilderness and Lagos was very embracing of, of family and friends and children and people as, as populating the landscape and engaging with the landscape and and what's quite interesting is that those toys, you know, they shot together quite a lot as well. Uh, so to have such contrasting styles and arguably philosophies a little bit, and yet both um, having significant impacts on the cultural um, outcomes, even having different sort of approaches, you know, it maybe talks a little bit about, I guess, what you've been doing is trying to explore what elements of Peter's and Lagos' work are the ones that actually reach people the most. What are those qualities? What are the aesthetics? What, what is the combination of of all of the above that that encapsulates something into a single image which which is a difficult thing to do uh, relative to a body of work that could speak to all aspects of it so good luck with the search I'm, i've been always been i've been curious with the campaign over the years and listening to bob here about talk about it in particular where where it's heading how it's going if it's building momentum and you know it's one thing to have the groundswell it's another to actually have a window into a political environment that's that's going to actually have the possibility of having decision making done to to make it happen uh, and that's that's a bridge to where the photography serves you know to connect people and, and and build that relationship with a place particularly in this case that was that wasn't there when most people in the last sort of you know born of the last 40 years had never had access to or, or never saw themselves so, so that's an unusual part of your campaign. Is 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 you you're trying to you're trying to present to people something historically rather than uh, in current history that you're trying to uh, bring it back to. Hmm. I think that's a really interesting point. Like it could sort of be considered as just a bit of a nostalgic greeny campaign. You know, I hear Bob Bushwalkers that just want to see their lake back sort of thing. But it's such a diverse range of people come and you know become members and join the campaign 
And I think probably 50% of them at least would not have been alive to be able to see the lake, but they've got somehow they have a connection with it or they feel like they've got a, you know, a, a role to play in restoring it and bringing it back. And again, the hope that it symbolizes for young people that actually we can take action on, you know, admitting and reversing past environmental mistakes for a better future. It's it's fantastic. Like it's it's great to be part of the such an optimistic campaign as well. I think you really, you really you really encapsulated the way you said that and repeated that twice. Like to have an opportunity to turn literally turn back time and show that it can be done to the world in such a a visceral and visually accessible way. It, this it probably stands alone in some ways around the world as the kind of campaign and what it represents and and how it could how it could pan out historically in terms of that that impact. Mm. Yeah, definitely. And because it's already got a global profile for unfortunately the wrong reasons in the disruption of Lake Pedder, it's it's sort of like it's not a project that um if and when the government decide to restore it, there's not a huge PR issue or anything around that. You know, they've already got the kudos globally to to make that happen. And it's um, you know, part of the international conservation um of nature. You know, they've got um different statements and motions around restoring it. And um, the Petter Empowerment itself is actually included in the World Heritage Area boundary, even though it's man-made um, empowerment with the intent that it is one day restored to its uh, original state. So, yeah, it's got the, the impetus there to make that happen. Yeah, wow. For some reason I didn't click to that, that it was still still in the TWHA. Wow, that's... That's hugely in its favour for starters, uh, and I guess it gives you gives you a lot to lean on um, from a you know political perspective as well. Because yeah, I mean that's the greatest level of protection on earth. If people didn't know that, that's that's top of the pops. That's that's not just yeah. a, a national or a state decision. There's a, that's a global deci- decision in a lot of ways, where it sits in the context of global significance and. Yeah, it, I you know I think I think Alagas was pretty upset that it happened, and I imagine he's pretty deflated after a while because he was right at the spearhead of the campaign to to save the petter, and it, and it, you know was unsuccessful at the time. Uh, so he would have you know fought even harder, I guess, for for its inclusion as well. Mm. We're kind of um, close to that back end of the show. Um, Tabas, unless there's anything else in particular you want to you want to speak to or share to people, or I, I think what could be appropriate maybe is if people are interested in learning more about the campaign or contributing yeah. to it, engaging with you, do you want to give them a few avenues to do that? Yeah, definitely. So um, in terms of the PETA campaign, it, like PETA.org is the website. There is just an entire library and archive of information, both historical if you're interested in the original lake and also obviously the restoration practicalities and the political scenario as well, as well as information on how you can get involved in the campaign. Um, In terms of the Wilderness Society campaigns, they're all um, up on the Wilderness Society website. There's a a ton of stuff that we'd never have time to cover (laughs) in in this show. So that's the best spot for for all of that. And the Bob Brown Foundation as well, they're the same. They they cover such a a diverse range of um, things that are happening in the planet. And I suppose um, me personally, um, I, I need to start doing a lot more with my work and I am planning an exhibition next year. So if anyone wants to stay in contact, I've got a, a website, which is just Tabitha Badger Photography. And if you just search Tabitha Badger on all the social media channels, you'll, you'll find me there as well. Awesome. Can't wait for that. <laughs> such, such great organisations, you know, Bob Brown, Wilderness Society, you know, do some really great work down in Tassie and, you know, and um, elsewhere too. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. They they they're really you know making good waves down there in, in you know fighting for the wild places and precious places that we have left, which really in this day and age really need protecting. So, yeah, love all that you do to help those places and advocate for for them because yeah, to to people that haven't been there themselves, they have no voice. Their their voice is 
experiencing them in person. And so, um, yeah, they need people like yourself that can show that with their photos and um, advocate for them and yeah, protect them in the best way that they can um, so that they can continue to exist and, yeah, inspire people and be a blessing to the planet rather than, you know, sold as wood chips to overseas or something like that. So, um, yeah, no, love, love to see it. Yeah, hats off, all the best for the, the campaign. I, I touched base with it at times and I Luke certainly touched base with it and been involved directly at times. And, uh, yeah, feel free if uh, at the same time to have that because it's a surprise um, in the circles that we run and we haven't actually met, to be honest. Um, and I know also I'd, I'd say too, if you're in, you know, keen to support it, you can also sign up to be a member and, and get updates and uh, to the Restore Petter campaign that is. Um, and that's always a great way to support and um, provide some funds that they can use for um, uh, promoting and, and um, you know, hopefully getting some traction or more traction on, on the uh, restoration of the lake. So that's pretty cool. So it's, yeah. uh, I was going to say, Tabitha, feel free to reach out if there's at times you're looking for other image makers or yeah. own pilots or different people. Um, I'm, I'm certainly happy to um, engage with that if I'm, I'm around and available. Yeah, yeah, 100% will do. And, um, yeah, shout out to Luke who has um, done a tremendous job on a few things that we've had happen in the campaign in the past as well. So thank you. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Um, I think I did a... Was it the paddle for Petter um, at the uh, under yeah. the Tasman Bridge? And that, that was a pretty interesting um, day with the wind, <laughs> but um, managed to get yeah. something out of that. So that yeah, was, um, that, was that, one. that was um, yeah, definitely <laughs> one of the the craziest things I've I've done. But um, no, that's um, that was a good good time. So <laughs> very good um, to have those sort of events where there's uh, some nice media exposure and promotion of of um, of the cause. So that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Work, we, we're, we're lucky to have people like you. Well, the earth is lucky to have sort of uh, peaceful warriors like yourself that uh, that are very authentically engaged in, in a real life way and in, in things that matter. Yeah, no, th thank you all. And you all do um, more than your fair share as well. So <laughs> thank you. Thanks so much. Well, yeah, I appreciate um, that. We'll we'll leave it there for tonight. Um, we'll all of the links to the various organisations and and Tabitha's uh, website will be in the show notes below uh, this video if you'd like to check them out. Um, and if you want more updates about what's happening on our show, um, please feel free to sign up to our mailing list, which is also included in the in the notes as well. Um, and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks' time for another episode. So thanks again for tuning in and. Um, until next time, good night and happy shooting. And uh, get your NLPA entries in. Oh, yeah, don't forget. <laughs>